Welcome, dear friends, to our Ascension Day service this morning. Today is yet another day of celebration. We are celebrating the Ascension of our Lord, destined to be at the right hand of God. His work on earth is done. Again, he can say, Tetelestai, it is finished. Now he will be glorified. This is our celebration, and my prayer is that through this service, we will be inspired to work on, the, on this earth to the satisfaction of the Father, so that ultimately we will all be glorified also like our Savior and Lord. May this service be a blessing to us all, and let us all, and let us all share with those whom we encounter uh, our experiences of today. Let us now have a moment of silence to invoke the presence of our Lord and Saviour. grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our God has ascended with a mighty shout. The Lord has ascended with trump trumpets blaring. Come let us sing praise to God together. For our God is sovereign over all the earth. We say together, come and worship people of God. Let us celebrate with songs of praise. For our God, the Most High, is seated on his holy throne, sovereign over all the earth. Let us worship together. Come, let us pray. O God of earth and sky, as Jesus came among us in Bethlehem to raise us up to heaven, so today we recall his departing from us at Jerusalem to be in all places. Though he is hidden from our sight, enable us to abide in him by the power and grace of the Holy Spirit until his mercy and grace fill your whole creation. God, you have glorified our victorious Savior with a triumphant resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven, where he now sits at your right hand, grant, we ask you, that his triumphs and glories may ever shine in our eyes to make us see more clearly through his suffering and more courageously endure our own. Being assured of his example, that if we endeavor to live and die like him for the cause of your love and in ourselves and others, you will raise our dead bodies again and conforming them to his glorious body. Call us above the clouds and give us possession of your everlasting kingdom through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. In his name we pray, the prayer that he had taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thine kingdom come, thine will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters, our scripture reading today on this Ascension Day is found in the Acts of the Apostles, Acts chapter 1, and we start reading from verse 1 to 11. Acts chapter 1, and we start reading from verse 1 to 11. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about 
all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, while he was going, and they were gazing up towards heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them, and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Come, let us pray. God, our Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. My dear friends, I want to speak to you today on this Ascension Day around the theme entitled Experiencing the Similarities Between Easter and the Ascension. Today I want to share with you how Ascension Day had plunged the disciples of Jesus in a similar situation as it was before Easter. Before Easter, after the incarceration and death of Jesus, the disciples were in a state of fear and shock and anxiety. They were initially scattered and eventually found themselves together, yet they were alone, not having the capacity to understand what was happening. Their world had fallen apart and their hope was shattered. For them, everything had come to an end. And despite many, the many times that Jesus predicted his death and subsequent resurrection, they could not grasp it. With his body in the tomb, they saw no future for themselves, and, they, and still they do not give themselves a chance to reflect on the things that he had told them. Otherwise, they would have waited for the third day with great anticipation. But then came the realities of the Easter dawn. 
Jesus broke through the seals of the graves and returned to the world. He made numerous appearances. And when this happens, it seems as if the disciples are filled with new life again. He goes on to he goes to various lengths to prove to them that he has returned to life and he relates to them the power and the majesty and the sole authority of God. Then comes the day of ascension. He is separated from them by a cloud, and he is shrouded in this cloud until the disciples could no longer see him. It was with heavy hearts that the reality of his final departure from them started to sink in. A cloud removes him from their sight and it's like experiencing his death all over again. However, there's difference this time from what it was when he was crucified. Prior to his crucifixion, he prepared them for his impending death and resurrection in Jerusalem. Although they heard this over and over again, they did not exercise active listening. But in the post-resurrection period, he prepares them to await the gift of the Holy Spirit and what it will do for and unto them. Through the Spirit, they will be empowered to witness to him and all that it stood for in Jerusalem and its surrounds and to the ends of the earth. This time they hear and they listen. The arrest and the trial and the ultimate death of Jesus, it stuns and it debilitates and incapacitated the disciples and everything came to a standstill in their lives and they were at the point of surrendering everything. On the Easter morn, they encountered the risen Savior and during the days that follow, he brought them a new message of their imminent empowerment through the promised advocate, and this alters their disposition dramatically. Now they have to wait again, and the question on their minds is, will there be a second Easter? After the crucifixion, The mutilated body of Jesus was lying in the tomb, awaiting the resurrection to a new life. However, after the ascension of Jesus, the disciples were hiding in the upper room, each awaiting an own resurrection through the gift of the power of the Holy Spirit. They are here in the upper room, under the strict instructions of Jesus who said to them, stay together, to wait in Jerusalem. And I suspect the anxious waiting prompted them to three, to pray together as they were awaiting the unknown. Together, my friends, with the disciples, together with the disciples, were among others, Mary, the mother of Jesus, and most probably members of his family. And then, of course, those ardent followers and friends of Jesus, Mary and Martha, not in the least. All of them were locked down in this historic upper room, waiting for yet another Easter experience. It is here in the upper room where they stayed together, waited and prayed together. Here they found themselves in the same position that Jesus was. The upper room now became their grave, and it is in this grave where they all together have to wait for another dramatic crack of dawn to establish 
a new reality. During the passage of time, they were gradually endowed with a spirit and on Pentecost born into a new and resurrected life. Staying together, praying together and waiting together, friends, may appear easy to do, almost passive, but how much of this can lead us to the same experience? For the sake of our empowerment, let us now for a while refrain from the distractions of just wanting to do our own thing. Refrain from quarrels among each other. Refrain from pulling rank one against the other. Refrain from imposing superiority on another. And refrain from despising the leadership of others. Despite each having their own ambitions, the disciples remained together and did not allow their differences to divide or to scatter them. For now, their personal interest became insignificant and their focus was on the charge of Jesus and that became their common priority. Remain in Jerusalem. Stay together. Wait together. Pray together. And for us, there is much to learn from what is transpiring in the upper room after the ascension of our Lord. No longer are they waiting or seeking their own narrow self-interest, but they are awaiting a promised gift of corporate empowerment that will enable them to all walk in unity and harmony towards the prevalence of the common good among all God's people and indiscriminate universal salvation. They are waiting patiently, they are staying together in unity, and they are praying fervently in faith for the unknown things that will erupt as a result of what they have to do collectively. Their weight, their corporate prayer, and their togetherness no longer comprise unrealistic expectations about what they can provide one another or even get from one another only to end up disillusioned and dissatisfied. This gathering of men and women is focused, on open, is focused and open to looking beyond themselves, not in theory only, but also in their exemplary way of life. So therefore, let us learn from this. Let us learn from this as a group that prays together. Their prayers are not centered around a list of what they want. On the contrary, dear friends, it transcends the superficial, self-centered relationship with God and goes way down deeper. Their private and corporate prayer is focused on the basic needs theory. Moreover, their waiting together involves deep reflection that extends into active listening and allowing God and God's will to direct their subsequent actions. Allow yourself to also feel the stillness in that upper room where this group is sits in silent prayer. It is in their meditative silence that the Holy Spirit finds place and finds space in their souls to rest and then eventually to multiply in order to fill them. Let us learn from them, my dear fellow followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. They stayed together, they prayed together, and they were waiting together. All this waiting for the things they have not yet seen. They have finally got to the point of getting it right, realizing that true discipleship is about 
emptying themselves and uninhibitedly allow God to be in charge, to believe that the promise of Jesus requires our unflagging faith and that God's will shall triumph. Waiting together is a testimony that our salvation comes by grace and by grace alone. That redemption, redemption is free and it's free through Christ alone. To wait in faith is an affront to this busy and self-important world. But doing this is a sign. <coughs> Excuse me, but doing this is a sign of hope to all those millions who wait because they have no choice, whose lives are waiting, and who fear their waiting is in vain. Those who hurry are busy with their own concerns, but those who wait may find themselves, much to their surprise, perhaps at God's service, that service which alone is perfect freedom. Today's passage from Acts ends, dear friends, with those disciples still in that upper room where they stay together, where they pray together, and where they wait together. What they anticipate is a second Easter. The first Easter taught them something it unstopped their ears so that they could hear the promise of the risen Christ. That promise is what enables them to stay together, what enables them to pray together, what enables them to wait together. They anticipated a second Easter, and soon it will be there. And when that happened, they can rise to a new life, and so can you and I. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Dear friends, come let us receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. <clears throat> the Lord makes his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lifts his countenance upon you and give you his peace. May the blessing of God the Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit descend upon us so that we may equally experience the second Easter, now and forever. Amen.